Okay, we can start with this student seminar that is one of the, it's going to be about ATLAS, so it's the first experimental like student two. seminar that we have in this student seminar series. So this is the time for Javier Jimenez, and he's going to talk about the alignment of the ATLAS inner detection. Okay, well, welcome everybody. As Roberto has said, I'm going to talk about the alignment of the Atlas Inner Detector. And I'm, I'm going to start with uh, a small introduction about what is the LHC and the Atlas Detector. Uh, I think you may all know what is the LHC, but just in case, there is the LHC is the largest proton-proton uh, collider ever built. It's built in, in Geneva, at, uh, between France and Switzerland, in, at CERN. And it has a it's, it has a ring of 27, 27 kilometers uh, perimeter, in which the 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 energy of the in the center of mass mass of the collision were seven and eight TeV uh, during the run one, that was uh, recorded during during 2009 and 2012, and we are um, we are expecting an energy in the center of mass of 13 T TeV for the upcoming collisions in the in the, uh, in this year and. And the future ones. So here you can see an, an aerial uh, site of the the of the of the place where the LHC is. This is the CERN, and you can see here draw the the the, the the where the LHC goes to to have a maybe a, an idea of the size. This is the airport of of Geneva. Uh, yeah. So here you can have also a plot of the of the tunnel with the LAC and a diagram showing uh, how it how it goes. You have four detectors on the on the LAC that are CMS and Atlas, the two of uh, general purpose detectors. One another one is Alice, which is made for studying uh, ion ion collisions, and also we have LHCB here that is. Uh, mostly uh, for studying B physics. Uh, the the wall tunnel is uh, underground, uh, below below ground and 100 meters, as you can see here in the diagram. Uh, I work for Atlas, and Atlas is this detector. It's a huge detector. You can see the the length is 25 meters uh, tall and 44 uh, meters wide. It weighs 7,000 tons. And you can see here, for example, the, the number of electronic channels that goes up to 100 million one. And uh, yeah, um, basically uh, with this, we, we measure the, the collisions and we have a, a record of what, what's going on when, when we have collisions. So let me explain the different parts. In the innermost parts, we have the inner detector, that is this yellow part here that uh, makes the the tracking that is to reconstruct what it does is to reconstruct the trajectories of the charged particles that are produced here in the collisions uh, more outer we have uh, the the calorimeters we have the, elect the electromagnetic one and the ionic one and on the last part we have the muon chambers that is also a kind of tracker but just for muon that goes through all the detectors and leave a signal just before leaving. So here we I show some photos of the ALAS detector, and on the next slide I have a diagram diagram showing which are the interaction that the particles that are produced inside the 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 ATLAS uh, have with the different parts of the detectors. As I have commented before, we have the beam pipe where the collisions uh, take place. Now, just after that, we have the inner detector. The inner detector makes a record the trajectory of the charged particles produced inside. So, for example, if you have an electron, you will see the, the trajectory it follows. Also, it works with uh, protons, muons, and all charged particles. For example, photons or neutrons don't leave any signal on the inner detector. After that, we have the electro electromagnetic calorimeter that uh, maybe you don't know, but a calor calorimeter, what it does is to measure the energy of the particles that goes through through them. So we have 
stress and electromagnetic calorimeter in which photons and electrons uh, are they they die here and its measure uh, its energy is measured. After that, we have the hadronic calorimeters in which, uh, for example, particles as protons or pions uh, are they stop here and its energy uh, is measured also. Um, the particle which survives more is the muon that traverses all the detectors and reaches the muon spectrometer that also uh, measures its momentum, and the neutrino which doesn't interact with anything of the detector and just escapes. So, uh, well, as I have commented before, I'm going to talk about the alignment of the inner detector. So let's focus on this part, on the yellow one. Is this is a, a zoom of the image? We can see that the in the the inner detector is also composed of very different sub detectors. We have in the innermost part the pixel detector, followed by the SET, that is this one. These both are based on silicon detectors, and uh, after that we have the TRT, that is the the outer part, that uh, is based on gas transition radiation tracker. You can see here the diagram and some photographs. And just to introduce how the LHC works, I have here a, a small video. No. Yeah. That explain how the... Here is the, the first accelerator that explain all the chain of accelerator that are placed in, in CERN, in which we, we pass from the the smallest, the smallest accelerator to the biggest ones, and when we have the enough energy, these are transferred to the LHC, that is the, the biggest one. And you can see here, this is the, the tunnel, and inside of the, this we have protons uh, circulating in opposite side, and they are made uh, to collide in some interaction points where we have the detectors. This is what is going to be shown here. This is ATLAS, and then when we have a collision, Atlas records what happens here. This is the inner part, this is the, the inner detector that makes the records the trajectories. Then you have the this green and uh, um, and yellow parts are the calorimeters measuring the energy. And the last part we have are the muon chambers that what oh, is a bit noisy now. Okay, you get an idea of how it works. So let's start with the in a detector. As I have commented before, it's composed of the TRT, the SET, and the pixel. These are the the different sub detectors and their intrinsic resolution. You can see that we have a very good resolution for every detector, but we need a, a good alignment. So why? Which is the importance of the alignment? When the detector was a, a first assembly, the, the the position of each of the detector was was known with much worse accuracy than the intrinsic resolution. So, at the end, you have a very pre precise detector, but you don't know what it is. So, the the measures that you make with it are not good because uh, they are going to be bias and you cannot make good physics from them so the alignment is a very important part of the of every particle experiment particle physics experiment because you need to know with with a precision such that the resolution of the detector is not affected by the the uncertainty in in their position so okay Let's explain a bit more what is uh, a misalignment. A misalignment is understood as the difference between the assumed position for a detector and its real position. Here, for example, you can see in this uh, simple example, imagine we know where this, the upper and the lower detector are with high accuracy, but we, we think that this detector is placed here, but in reality, it is displaced a bit so when we have a heat in this detector, we assume that the heat is in another position different from its real position, and then we are introducing introducing bias in the measures. Here you can see this is the the real heat, but we are assuming that it's here because of the 
movement of the detector, and this works the works in the, the resolution of the detector. So the base the baseline goal for the in a detector alignment is to determine the position of each of the individual detectors such that, that the track parameters resolution are not significantly significantly degraded. That this means that they are not degraded in more than a twenty percent. For example, what does it, it mean for a pixel detector? To be not to not be degraded more than a twenty percent means that you do need to know the the position of every pixel module with a, an accuracy better than time time micros. So on next slide I explain the basics of the alignment algorithms. What we do is to define a, a residual vector that is the difference between the real heat on or the measurement in red and the extrapolated heat into the reconstructed track. So you have this heat but you construct the track with more information, not just not this heat but with all the heats. So at the end you the your track doesn't pass by every heat. You have a the better fit. So you at the end have a, a, a vector telling you which is the difference between every heat and the and the extrapolated track. And we we have this vector of of uh, residuals. With that, we construct a uh, a function called the G square function, in which we introduce these uh, resi residuals vectors and the the correlation matrix that, that is a matrix that tell you how correlated how which are the correlation between every detector and the other ones. So at the end, you you have a a huge system of linear equation that you need to solve. By minimization, the the g square function uh, uh, attending to um, some aligned parameters that are three translation in the special uh, space and three rotation. This is the if you have a detector, you can move it in the three dimensions and also rotate it in the three axes. So every module has six degrees of freedom, which are the these align parameters for every module and you minimize the g square function that is just one big uh, equation for all the detector together uh, you minimize for every of these uh, degrees of freedom uh, you can see for example here notice that uh, the inner detector is embedded in a in a b field so the trajectories of the charged particles are uh, helical ones and this is important because the the algorithm knows that and always try to reconstruct tracks as if they were helical uh, here I'm, I enter a bit more into the detail of the algorithm this is the equation I have commented before and the one which we minimize according to these uh, alignment parameters and we have the residual vectors and the covariance uh, matrix of the detector measurements. So also there is a depending of the, the number of degrees of freedom we align because we can have for example just to align we can align just the pixel as a wall detector that it just have six degrees of freedom, the three translation and the three rotations, or we can align every module with these uh, large numbers of degrees of freedom freedom which gives you another a lot of levels. So depending on how many degrees of freedom we are going to introduce into the solving, there are two solving modes. One is the global one that in this covariance matrix uh, we introduce the the correlation between all the detectors. You can see here is this is the 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 big matrix that is related to this covariance matrix and you can see here how the different degrees of freedom are, are, are related between them. And if we have a very a, a lot of degrees of freedom, we cannot use this uh, correlation matrix because the, in, the the inverting and the solving of this equation is very difficult if we have a, a very large and dense matrix. So what we do is to do a local method that only uh, makes correlation for 
each detector in individually. So we just have the correlation between the six degrees of freedom for each detector, but not with the rest of the of the modules of the detectors. So when the alignment is done, remember this example I explained before. We had these two upper and lower detectors well aligned, but we have a, a misalignment of this this uh, detector. So when resolving, we get a solution that tells us that this detector should be translated in this direction a bit. And when you do, you obtain a, a, a new refitted track in which the residuals mean is 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 zero for all the detectors. This is what you get after the alignment. You can see here, depending on, on the levels of alignment that I'm going to explain just in the ne next slide, or, or in two slides, the different degrees of freedom that we have uh, for 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 the solving. For example, if we align at level one, that basically we take the wall as the biggest structures as as a wall. For example, the TRT as a wall, or the pixel as a wall. We just have uh, 30 degrees of freedom. But if we align up to module level, that is level three, we get more than 7,000 700,000 degrees of freedom. So the alignment procedures goes at this one. We have some data with a uh, determined geometry. It's reconstructed with a geometry. And we calculate the, re the residuals for every track with this geometry. Then we divide, for that, we divide the, due to the large number of events, we divide this uh, calculation of the residuals in parallel jobs. And we merge. And then we solve the, the matrix. And we get a new alignment constant that we introduce again and we can calculate the residual so we do that in an interactive in an interactive way so the the solution converges here for example i explain the the different alignment levels that i have commented before you have the trt the ct and the pixels and this is a new detector that has been included now the ibl level 1 you take pixel as a as a pixel a structure and you align just the pixel also for the CT and the TRT, they are separated. Level two, you take each of these parts of the pixel, each layer, and you align independently. And then it, there is a more complex alignment, this level three, in which you take every detector and you align it uh, independently. Uh, another point that I have commented before is that we do this in an iterative, iterative way. We get some correction at the beginning, and we introduce this correction again, and we recalculate, we recalculate the residuals, and we resolve until the system converges. And you can see here, for example, that in this example, we needed six iterations to to have zero correction at the end. For uh, well, the alignment was already implemented in the run one of the LAC, and it it give uh, it it gave uh, good results. You can see here on this plot, this is every run, every uh, every run is a, a run is a, a period of time in which we are taking data. For every run of 2012, we made a, we followed the, uh, how the, the, cost, the alignment constant evolved with the time. And we have this plot showing how the detectors move. For example, this displacement here, may coincide, for example, with sometimes the, the coolings went off and then we have a movement of the pixel or sometimes the solenoids were ramped down. So all the operational of, of the Atlas detector m introduce some movements and deformation in the, in the detector that, that we have to correct for every run because if we don't, for example, if we have this constants and we continue with reconstructing the data with this constant and we don't, realign here that we see a change the the physics that we are going to obtain from this data is not going to be useful so apart from the from the alignment algorithm that i have explained before there was an important point that i commented that it reconstructs the tracks as helical trajectories and what it does is to try to to make the, all the tracks uh, as an helical trajectory. If you have a deformation that in somehow def um, makes a bias into your tracks, but 
you end with an, another helical uh, trajectory, your algorithm is not going to to detect this as a deformation because it sees that you got a, a helical trajectory as you expected and it, it said it's good. But and this example here shows how the the, uh, the alignment algorithm is unable to detect, for example, a twist deformation. A twist deformation is that you get the detector is like a, a cylinder and you twist one side to one one of the ends to one side and the other to the other side. So you kind of twist the detector. With that kind of deformation, the, the tracks you are going to get are still helical, but the momentum that you have measured is not correct. So here you, you can so see in black, this is the nominal geometry. And you see that we don't have any, this is more or less uh, a measure of the, the error in the momentum. And you see that we don't have any error. We introduce this twist and we reconstruct and we see that we have a, an error. So when we uh, use the alignment algorithm in on that uh, distorted geometry, as we are getting once again helical trajectories, we are not able to correct this and we end with the same deformation. So we have to look for another kind of method to, to correct this deformation. This is done with uh, universal observa observables as for example the mass of the of the Cayenne boson is to for example we use the we reconstruct the mass of the set the Cayenne into, into two muons and if you have a, an error in the momentum as the mass is recontracted by the by combining the two muons in a if each of the muons have an error of the, in the momentum the mass you are going to reconstruct is not going to be good so uh, we use uh, this kind of uh, universal observables to detect this uh, deformation that are, are known as weak modes and to correct them. For example, another we, I have some before the twist deformation, but another kind of deformation that gives you helical trajectories is to move every cylinder uh, a bit with, within an increases radius. So the when you go out, you move more, and this gives, for example, for possible p particles you get more momentum, and for negative particles you get less momentum. Uh, this technique was used during round one to detect. Uh, this plot shows the calculates the deformation in the momentum uh, by reconstructing the mass of the set. Here you can see the this kind of deformation that introduce a bias in your momentum that basically if you invert you see how your momentum varies and then if you have two muons you reconstruct the mass and you're, you are going to have a deformation a, uh, proportional to the deformation square here for example another example of, of the reconstructed mass of the JSI is this peak here uh, all this has been used uh, during round one with successful results. This is before the using this technique and after you can see that we have errors of around 1 TV minus 1 that if you have a momentum of 50, 50 uh, GV is more or less 1% uh, of error in the in the momentum. That is very big. After using this technique of reconstructing the mass of the set, uh, we get a much uh, nicer behavior. Another information that we can use uh, to detect this kind of weak modes or deformation that the alignment algorithm doesn't detect by itself is the to use the information of the calorimeter because basically the calorimeter uh, measures the energy of a particle. And if you know the mass of this particle, if you know that it was an electron, if you know if you have the mass and the energy you can measure the momentum is the same and you can compare this this measure of the momentum with the one you have within a detector and then you can make a, a kind of right ratio between the the energy of the calorimeters and the momentum that you have in your inner detector and if your detector is well aligned you should have a, a ratio equal to 1 but differences in this ratio can be measured with this method and you can also try to 
get rid of these uh, weak modes. Uh, here it shows the results of uh, measuring the the resolution in the momentum with this system with this um, method. The both method, uh, the one with the mass of the third, for example, and this have its pros and contras. Uh, this ones, the the one of the biggest point, the a good point for this method is that the the deformation is proportional to sagitta, while in the other case was proportional to the square, so it's more sensitive. But in the other hand, you are comparing with a uh, energy measured by the calorimeter that has a worse resolution than your tracking system, so you have to use both at the end. And to, with the final part of my my talk, I'm going to talk about the preparation that from the alignment team we are having for the run two of the LHC. You may know that the LHC is now has been stopped now, but uh, it was a stop up, uh, at the end of round one, and during this time we have the long the long shutdown one that was a long technical stop uh, in while and. We have performed a lot of uh, maintenance works in the detector. We have introduced also in more detectors in the in the inner detector. We have added this IBL, for example, and with using now the, in this uh, shutdown, we have upgraded the the alignment procedures to to cope with the requisites we need for run two. And this last month, we have been taking data not with the with the beams not with collision but with cosmic radiation you may you i think you all know the what is the cosmic ra radiation we have a uh, radiation from natural radiation that mos mostly comes from high energy particles from the outer space that when they crash with the atmosphere there are there is a, a kind of avalanche of particles and we have a lot of in the end, a lot of muons that are perfect for the alignment because are charged particles that traverse all the detectors, and we can make an alignment with them. Even when Atlas is underground, is 100 met meters underground, we still got uh, radiation uh, at this level. I show you here the which are the the parameters of this cosmic radiation. This is a a, a draw of the design of the Atlas cavern, and you can see here we have two uh, entrance. One is for the elevator that goes gets you down, and this is for the extraction of air, I think. And you can see here, this is the the eta. Eta of the, is a parameter that tells you the orientation along set. And you can see here that with the, this cosmic ray data, we see the two the two holes. In others, we have a peak corresponding to this big hole and, on, and another small peak corresponding to the elevator hole. You can see here in this plot the energy of the, the typical energy of these uh, muons that we, we can reach uh, very high energies uh, around the mass of the set or so. Um, yeah. So what, what, which was the status of the inner detector after this long shutdown one? For example, the ICT and the TRT, the barrels have been have not been moved during the lot down one. So at the beginning we assumed the, that they were in the same position that before. But for example, the pixel was removed and put back in place after and uh, during this long shutdown one uh, for for making um, a maintain, maintenance of the detectors. And from the survey we knew that the, it was expected to be in the same position with a precision of 100 microns. Another, for example, this is a picture of the installation of the IBL. IBL is a new layer of pixel closest to the to the interaction point, and this is the first time we have the IBL. So we have no we have no previous experience from round one with the IBL, and the initial position for, for the IBL was totally unknown. Uh, with the first data that we collected during these cosmic campaigns, one of the, for example, uh, an important point is that we we have detected that there was an error in the in the 
in the building of one of the pieces of the IBL because we have a in reality we have a piece that was two millimeters wider than what was appearing in the in the design and this made the IBL to to be uh, translated two millimeters along the beam pipe here is a plot showing the residuals this re remember that the residuals are the 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 distance between your heat real heat and the and the 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 position you assign did heat this heat in in the track and we can see that before the alignment we have the mean of this residual distribution two millimeters away from the from zero this means that you assume that the IBL is in one position when you reconstruct the track you assign the, its hits to the track and you see that we are getting all in in like in average we are getting all the hits like displaced two millimeters this means that the IBL is really in display and after our first alignment very simple alignment we will recover a mean zero for the IBL so we know where it is and also we will recover a lot of uh, efficiency for the IBL. Before the alignment we were seeing mostly no hits on the IBL because of this huge shift and after this first alignment we we started to see this is the typical shape for, shape for cosmic uh, for cosmic rays. This gives you more or less the the position in the in the cylinder so you expect having hits from above but not from the sides because and this is what we see here we we have uh, hits here in the upper and the lower part but not in the in the middle region and you can see in this plot on the on the right the the huge increase on the efficiency of every detect every every piece of the detector after the alignment at the beginning we have a an efficiency of the IBL hits lower than 0.4 and we got a uh, uh, close to one efficiency after the alignment. After that we have taken more data and we are we have been able to make a more detailed alignment. Uh, and ending with a module by module alignment of the IBL and the pixel. And you can see here the, the improvement that we have with this alignment for all the this distribution. This is the IBL that shows a a very wide distribution before the alignment but after correcting we we have a, a much thinner one uh, with the mean in zero also the pixel uh, shows a big improvement he, this is the SCT and the TRT you can see that all detectors uh, are improved with alignment another thing this is a diagram of the IBL IBL is composed of 14 staves and a stave each, each, each of these uh, a block of detectors they are placed in in in, a, in a staves we have 14 along the around the the beam and each of these staves has 20 modules so what we see with this module by module alignment is that at the beginning the shape of the of the of each of these states were not flat that but it had a kind of bowing this that is can be seen here and after doing the level 3 alignment we are able to correct this we, we don't correct the IBL we the IBL is still bowed but w we correct the position we assume for every module so now we see that after correcting the, po the apparent position of every module we start to see a zero residuals mean for every of this module we also have seen that the 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 length of each stave was a bit longer in reality than the expected one and we can also take that into account and just to finalize another method we have used to test the the goodness of the alignment we have cosmic rays they have a, a big difference uh, with the collision data is that cosmic rays come from above and traverse all the, the detector while collision just starts in the center and goes uh, out so if we have this kind of data we can divide 
the upper part and the lower part of the of the tracks like we have the wall track and we divide into two and then we reconstruct every part as an independent one and then we compare for example the momentum of this track with the momentum of this track that should be the same because it's the same particle and we what we see in this plot is the for example this one is the the momentum measured before and after the alignment you can see here that we have an error uh, up before the alignment that we correct with alignment and all, uh, similar behavior for example the d0 gives you the position the distance with the <coughs> with respect the interaction point and you can see in this plot that before aligning aligning we we are getting the each tracks uh, separated and after aligning we we make them co coins to coin coin ah, to have a coincidence in the in the in the yeah in this parameter so with that i conclude which are the conclusions aldas is one of the detector placed at the lhc aldas relies on the inner detector for the tracking for the tracking of the producer's particles without a proper alignment it's not pos possible to fully exploit the excellent resolution of the inner detector um, without this alignment the alignment is a major task because it's a, it affects the quality of all the data recorded with the in atlas and w which is later used for the analysis so if you don't have a good alignment you are not going to have good data and the analysis you can do with this data is not going to be good also uh, apart from correcting the formation with the with the with the alignment algorithm i have also explained to you that we have kind of deformation nodes at weak modes that preserve the helical uh, shape of the tracks and this has also to be detected and corrected because even when they they don't affect the helical shape they vary the parameters for example the mass that you reconstruct is going to be grown if if you have this kind of deformation um, the last two points are, are talks about the the preparation we have from during this long, long shutdown one after the wrong one for preparing the inner detector for the for the upcoming collisions that we have introduced a new IBL that and we have performed a first alignment so when we have the first collision we are going to have a better sh shape detector for this upcoming collision and this is all so thanks for your attention comments are and questions are welcome Questions? Yeah. Uh, well, maybe you have mentioned, but uh, why do you need uh, so many uh, subsystems uh, inside the thinner? One of the reasons, uh, of course, is the, the density of the. Yeah. The heat. Well, is that the only, the only reason? Let me go to the. This point. Yeah, this detector, the pixel one, are the one, the ones with the better intrinsic resolution. So you would like to have this kind of detector full in all the space, but the the problem is, is that they cost much more. So you have a limited amount of money. So you make your best detectors in the inner more innermost place, and then you have to complete the the outer the outer um how do you say yeah on the for example an, an important point from the inner detector is these four layers are made for example the ABL has been included very close to the beam pipe to determine with a very uh, res good resolution which are the impact parameters impact parameters are for example where does the track comes from it comes from uh, the, the collision point or it comes from another secondary vertex this is very important for example for B tagging because the the B, B charged particles link leaves uh, some time and they, dis they have a displacement from the interaction point to a, a secondary vertex where they decay so for example for B tagging for triggering data with halves uh, comes from B quarks you need a, a very high resolution in the for example the, the distance that they have been displaced from the primary vertex 
So yeah, if you had a lot of money, you could have a better detector for all the all the space. Also, for example, the TRT is another technology, but it gives you a lot of points that is good to 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 measure the the momentum because you have a a, a huge density of points, so that you can make the curvature with a with a good resolution. Yeah, but. Which one? Uh, the very last one before the summary. Okay, track parameters. Yeah. This one? Yeah, what was the difference between the two? What's the one up and the one This one and this one? Energies now, so the, yeah, that one different energies? No, this is uh, the charge over the PT. Yeah. So basically, it's the measure of the curvature of the particle, the momentum. Yeah. And the other one is what I was talking about. Is D zero is one of the impact parameters that tell you the distance from the the primary vertex. We we have uh, another parameters as for example the 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 angle with it it goes for example the 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 inclination of the particles. This we are measured that with another parameter that is eta. We have uh, yeah, more more parameters to determine the trajectory. We need five that are these ones. We have two spatial points that give you the distance along the beam and transversal to the beam. This is the orientation in in phi. The orientation the angle with respect to the beam and the momentum. More questions? I, I have a question. I mean, with the data of Cosmic Ray, you yeah. can use this also to, to improve the resolution for displaced vertex and all this type, type of analysis, no? Because your Cosmic Ray is not going to pass by the center of the... Of the yeah, you, you have the some... Protons colliding. You have some... Uh, characteristics of the cosmic rays that that collision don't have, for example, that they traverse all the detector, and this can be used to to study the how is, how the resolution how, for example, the resolution we we have with with the with respect to the parameters, for example, for the momentum, because you have a track that traverses all the detector, you can divide it into two, you, you and you know that this have has to have the the same parameters, so you can compare, and the difference if the alignment is perfect, the difference comes from the resolution you have in this parameter. Yeah, also, I think this type of analysis is more robust for when you do translations, rotations, and stuff like that, because it's not there is it not the symmetry of the of the cylinder. Yeah. Because the particle is passing. Yeah. By the and this the this is going to be important while when we have first collision, not at the physical energy, but maybe low energy, in which we can, because the problem with cosmics is, there are two problems, mostly is that they come from above, so you don't have a homogenic distribution, so the detectors on the sides are worse aligned, and also the, the, the rate of data taking is low, so you cannot, for example, for we are talking here about millions of events that at the end we have to select and we get thousands of tracks we can use for alignment but you can get this in collision with one hour or less and for that we you, we have to wait weeks I have another question the, I mean this because you, you talk about uh, curls or yeah, twist know, or the type kind of Possible rigid transform, uh, transformation of the, yeah. uh, of the different layers of the detector, but also it's possible that, for instance, contraction or dilatation of the, I mean, like a single pixel, get yeah, we, with the surrounding ones. Or yeah, we we do that with the 
this level three that is modeled by detector by detector individually. We get every pixel and we align it. Even in during run one, we we went a bit uh, further and we did an alignment of the detector itself. But because in principle uh, your your detect pixel detector is flat, but it could be that because of the gluing or so, it has some combing or some bowing shape. Uh, we show that uh, in, on run one for the some pixel detectors. This can get very complicated uh, <laughs> <laughs> to realign to calibrate the. Yeah. And and I question the IBM is like the pixel detector, but smaller and with better resolution because. It's yeah, the, tec to the, the technology the is is diff is not the same technology. For example, we have is the first time. We have the four detectors at each side a uh, new technology called well it's the three D technology that instead of usual silicon is usual silicon detector uh, you have a sub substract and then a layer of uh, highly dope materials. Three D what it does you have the substrat and you make like holes with these uh, uh, highly dope materials. Um, with this uh, new technology, for example, you get rid of some effects. For example, one is the Lorentz angle. That if, if you have, if you had a, a, a B field here in the when your the charge that you produce in the inside the detector, it have it travels some time, some distance. If you have a B field, they are going to to move. But with the 3D, you move transversal to the Feel and you are not going to be affected by the this Lorentz effect. So uh, the technology is not the same. Also, we are closer. So this is a very important point for detecting the the impact parameters. Uh, yeah, similar but not the same. Improved. Yeah, because it was installed, installed later. It was, was installed, installed during after one one. So this is the first real data that we have recorded with this IBM. Uh, more questions, comments? Last chance. If not, we thank Javier again. <laughs>